Welcome to Not Starving Artists, the podcast. I'm your host, Brooke Benson, money coach and equity actor. I am your financial cheerleader, here to help you build your financial confidence and have power over your money. The best part, no budgeting or bi-weekly paychecks required. I went from being a broke BFA grad having weekly panic attacks about money to a financially confident, wealth-building actor and business owner. Money gets to feel fun, simple, and sexy, and I am going to show you how. So much of money has to do with your emotions and your feelings. So much of the action that's happening around your money, your spending habits, your saving habits, how you tactically use your money is affected by your feelings and your emotions, okay? So because of this, it is so, so important for you to be in touch with your feelings and your emotions. And I have a couple of things to say about this, which is why I'm going live here. The first thing, so I got this question um, in a question box this weekend that was like, what kind of work did you do to get so in touch with your emotions? Because I'm a big feeler. I feel my emotions. It is like one of the top priorities in my life to just always be feeling my feelings to the depths of the, the realm of where they live, right? And I was sitting with this question because I didn't know how to answer it at first. And what I realized is why this was hard for me to answer is because doing this work is really inconvenient. Getting in touch with your emotions, feeling your feelings, being able to work with your emotions, it is inconvenient work. You can't just sit down with your journal in the morning and process your emotions. Like, that's not how this works. Sure, when you journal and like think things out and like process through some stuff, you can have a journaling session for that. But if you're trying to like section off processing your emotions to a certain time of the day when it's convenient for you, like in the morning or in the evening, or like I'm gonna go listen to a meditation that's gonna help me feel things during this 15 minute break that I have, like, that's not how this works. It's not. And I'm saying this because I used to try and do that so often. And so I'm going to get back to like what the actual work looks like for me now. But what I used to do was I used to try and like process my emotions through journaling and through like set up and sit down kind of times, whether it was through guided meditations, through journal prompts, through like sitting and doing like a somatic exercise when I was available to, I would do stuff like that. And what I realized was that this wasn't allowing me to process how I normally used to process. So I went back to my childhood, right? My like teenage years and I threw tantrums, tantrums. I would sob. I would scream. Like I was such a big, big feeler to the detriment of my parents because I also didn't know how to not target it at someone. So it was usually targeted at my parents. <laughs> sorry, sorry, y'all. Um, so it was usually targeted at them, but that that's what it looked like. So I know I like look back and I'm like, my body knew how to move through an anger, a frustration, a sadness, a whatever. It knew how to work through that and it would just do it. Like I had no, <laughs> I had no walls up when it came to feeling. But then as I got older, right, it was like you kind of, you grow up and you, I started to think, it was like I had grown out of those kinds of feelings. I knew how to control my feelings and regulate better. And so those kinds of outbursts and especially the ones that didn't make sense to me, right? That were just like coming out of nowhere. I was like, oh, I know this is just an emotion that like isn't, you know, tied to what I'm like actually thinking and feeling. Like I learned how to like smartly, like a big girl process my emotions. But what I was actually doing, it was stifling them because I didn't know how to not have a tantrum while still fully processing. And so it was about a year and a half ago, I was reminded by one of my coaches. She was like, do you like cry? And I was like, oh yeah, all the time. And she was like, how often have you cried recently? And I was like, oh, right. Like I haven't cried recently. Like I'm not uh, crying on a consistent basis. That's actually not normal for me to be moved to tears, not just by sadness or frustration, but by happiness. Like, oh, there's some numbing going on. That's not good. And so she asked me about how I processed in childhood. And she reminded me that 
feeling as my superpower, right? Like not everyone just inherently knows how to process like that. And so like my tantrums were actually a superpower. Again, sorry, mom and dad didn't know how to not direct it at you, but that was my superpower. And so it was reminding myself that feeling is my superpower. And so I already know how to do it. I just have to get myself out of the way to like unclog the pipes in order to let myself do it. So the process of unclogging the pipes, this is what I did. I mean, the first thing that I was trying was right, like doing um, a guided meditation or like sitting down with my journal and talking to, you know, the inner child work and parts work is what they call it. But basically I was just talking a little Brooke, right? And I would like channel her. I put my hand on my heart because that's where I feel her. And I talked to her because I was feeling a lot of fear, a lot of uh, anxiety. And I was like, where's this coming from? And I would picture her and I would talk to her. And so I would, I would cry and feel emotional thinking about her and thinking about how much I loved her. And then I was thinking about future me, right? Talking to me right now in the same way. And that would really move me. So that specific kind of somatic work tapped me into like an emotional well that I had totally blocked and forgotten about. So that was the first thing. And then once that well started to get a little bit unblocked, what started happening is throughout my day, I would feel the urge to cry, or I would feel like strong resistance in my body. Like all of a sudden my body actually started signaling to me more. And because I was focused on it, because this was something I was being intentional about, I started to feel it and hear it more. And so my next work was not ignoring it when it came up and not saying, uh, I'm going to deal with this tomorrow morning during my journaling session. It was like, oh, I'm going to literally stop mid-sentence typing and I'm going to go to my bed and I'm going to like lean over the side of the bed and I'm going to cry or whatever needs to come out, right? And so it was more the inconvenience of that. And why why this question even came up uh, when it was sent in was because I was talking about how I like accidentally sobbed at a coffee shop this weekend because I like wasn't expecting a play to, to hit that hard. I was reading A Christmas Carol, a new adaptation of it. And I don't nor I don't really resonate with A Christmas Carol, but this adaptation, I was like, <gasps> right, I was sobbing. And the reason I let myself sob in the coffee shop, right? If I have sunglasses on, I'll put them on to like not make a huge scene, but I'm never going to stifle the cry because I feel it get stuck, right? If I stifle all of a sudden, like my throat tightens up a little bit, like I feel it starting to get stuck. That's the worst thing I can do for my emotions. So even though like, you know, get over the embarrassment of it, I was like, right, if if people see me sobbing, I'll just tell them I'm reading this great play, right? Or like, I've cried on the subway before. I mean, we all have, right? If you live in New York, I hope everyone has, right? Like, that's like a rite of passage. But like crying on the subway, if you're like at a party and you need to excuse yourself to the bathroom to just go cry for a minute, like I do that shit all the time because my emotions aren't convenient. They're not. And sometimes... Emotions are going to come up that have nothing to do with what's currently happening, right? Like I could be in the best mood, feeling so relaxed, and all of a sudden, this thing now feels safe to come up to the surface, and I'm like, oh my god, I don't know what's happening, right? And I'll have to like go excuse myself, or like, thank god I have such a supportive and wonderful partner who understands all of this, and I can just like start sobbing and be like, yeah, just like feeling a thing, I'm good though, right? And he's like, oh cool, let me know if you need anything, he'll bring me water, like it's such a wonderful supportive environment in my apartment, right? So I don't have to uh, stifle myself there. But my the moral of this story is that that's what I mean by it becomes inconvenient work, because you're not going to be able to section it off into a journaling session. It's about giving yourself what you need. Uh, For example, this morning, this morning, this is an example of me um, being in touch with my emotions and, and not stifling them and not pushing through them, like bulldozing, because I, as like an overachiever, as someone who's very like, get shit done. Like I'm just very, uh, yeah, I just like want to do all the things and do them quickly. And I have a tendency to like steamroll my own needs and what my body wants and as someone who has a very strong like gut intuition and gut feeling that's like the worst thing I could do for being able to like live my life because I need to be able to listen to my body and listen to my gut and tell her I'm listening to you 
So this morning I was planning on getting so much work done today. I have no calls today. I had so much content I was going to create. I was going to edit a bunch of podcast episodes I recorded last week. I had like two auditions I was going to film today and I woke up, didn't sleep super well last night. I spent the morning on the roof, like looking at the sun, said bye to Brady and then I was sitting on the couch and I was about to get work done and I was like, I am resisting everything. Nothing felt like it was coming easy. It felt like I was like trudging through mud as I was trying to do all the things I was excited about doing today and I'm tired and I was like, okay, nothing is urgent. Nothing is red alert. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put on an episode of Gilmore Girls and I'm going to do, I'm finishing up a paint by number right now. Um, it's taking much longer than I expected and I'm doing a paint by number and I was like, I'm just going to paint until this episode of Gilmore Girls is done and then I'm going to see how I feel. And so I did that and now I'm sitting on the couch and I was seeing how I was feeling and then I checked on my Instagram and I felt inspired to talk about this, how I feel my feelings and like, how did I learn to tap into this? And I felt called to go live. So like, this is what I'm doing here, here live now. I have done nothing of what I thought I was going to do today. And it's because I was listening to my body. Because if I pushed through and just like created a bunch of content and edited all my podcast episodes, one, the content wasn't going to be good, right? It wasn't going to feel good and it wasn't going to end up doing well because I'm not in it, right? So I didn't do that. And I also know that that would cause me to have a ripple effect, like for the rest of this week to be like frustrated and cranky and like I never want to be in that space of like living for the weekend because I work for myself that's fucking dumb that I would ever have that energy so that's what I'm doing right now right so it's like letting myself feel my emotions but also listening to my body and telling her that I'll give you what you need and that includes emotions and that includes feeling. Um, so inconvenient work, inconvenient, inconvenient, inconvenient. Honestly, if you are not crying a couple of times a week, you got some clogged pipes. That is truly how I feel. I think we were meant to cry. We are emotional beings, right? And so being moved to tears, again, this doesn't mean that you're crying out of sadness and frustration a couple of times a week. I feel like more often than not right now, I'm crying out of like joy and love. Like reading that play, it was so like, how it's so silly. It's a Christmas girl. I've never cried about a Christmas girl before. Um, but it just moved me so much. And it wasn't because the play was sad. It was just like, there was so much love and heart in it, right? Like parts of it are sad, but like moved to tears because of how much I love the craft of theater and that plays are able to do this to me to other human beings like I was crying because of that right um sometimes I'm crying because of sadness and frustration of course but being moved to tears is really important I think that's my very strong opinion um so yeah so in addition to that it's also about me keeping my my emotional well open and able to receive which oh I mentioned this on Instagram this past weekend too I'm extremely picky about the kind of media that I consume right like everyone's always giving me show and movie recommendations if you have ever given me a tv show or movie recommendation I'm like oh my gosh yeah I'll put that on my list I'm never gonna watch it I'm gonna be honest with you I will never watch it because I am so motherfucking picky about what I watch because like true crime documentary like all the ones that come out on you know Netflix every other week or um really intense like I'm trying to think of uh like this is why I didn't watch Game of Thrones for ages right or this show um Suits I'm watching Suits for the first time ever but just like really high intensity and dealing with a lot of like yeah, Suits isn't that bad. But let's take Game of Thrones, for example. Like, the fighting, the gore, the trauma. Oh, my God. Like, it's just so much. And it's, when we're talking, like, true crime documentary stuff, it's too much. It's, like, trauma dumping. And, like, the... I, I'm so... I've never become desensitized to, like, fighting and blood and, like... Oh, this is also why I can't watch Grey's Anatomy. Like, nothing medical. It makes my anxiety go through the roof, right? Because of, like, the stories of people losing loved ones. Like, holy shit. How are you able to, like, hear a story like that or, like, see something like that and not be immensely affected? Like, I, I, 
it is an absolute no for me. And the reason I have to be so picky is because I don't want to accidentally become desensitized. I don't want to have to put up that wall of like, okay, I'm just not going to think about it so I can watch through this show and get through this show. I can't. That's why I'm such a comfort show watcher. And I used to think that was a bad thing. I used to be like, oh, like, yeah, like something about me needing comfort shows or like watching the same things over and over again was a bad thing. And I don't think it is because it's it's me being able to keep my emotional wells open because if if I... It, when I say emotionally affected, I'm willing to be moved by something if it's worth it. And shows and movies these days, hardly ever worth it because they're so bad. They're so bad. Like the storytelling is so shitty. It's so shitty these days. And, and there are still some really great stuff being made. And I've seen some really fantastic stuff. Like one of the movies I saw recently in the theaters, Problemista, so fucking good and emotional and moving, but they like earned me being moved by their storytelling. Fucking Rings of Power, it's satire at this point, so it, it doesn't affect me too much, but like I actually do have to close my eyes when they start doing the like cutting off the heads and the blood stuff. It's so, it's so gory to an extent that it doesn't need to be. Um, but I'm able to watch that because it feels satirical now. But like the storytelling of that is so it's so unearned like it's so unwarranted so I want to continue to be moved by things emotionally but I'm not gonna do it if it's not earned because then I feel like I've been used like I've been what do I like manipulated into feeling something and then I don't feel good about feeling that kind of stuff so anyway me being able to keep my wells open, that's part of it, right? And it's part of why I have to be so conscious about the kind of things that I hear and consume and talk about. Like when people are just like talk, I'm not going to get into this, but like when we're at, when I'm at like a big family gathering or something, I'm not at those usually, but like people are just like chatting about really horrible, dramatic things or like really, right? The stuff that's happening in the world, just like kind of casually in conversation, it just, it doesn't. I can't compute it because I'm like, how can we talk about this casually? So anyway, moral of all of this is that in order to keep your emotional wells open, in order to allow yourself to be affected, you have to be conscious about what you're letting yourself take in, right? Because if you're taking in anything and everything, but you're also allowing yourself to be affected, it's going to, it's going to be way too much, way too much, right? So the other thing I'll say here too, is that I'm not perfect at this because I have anxiety too. And having my emotional wells open and being able to be affected by anything all the time, my anxiety really yells at me a lot of the time, right? Of like, this is too much. This, what if this is too much? It's more, it's more that thought that it's like, close down, close down. What if this becomes too much? What if you can't process this? What if you can't handle this? Right. And, uh, sometimes she wins out and I do kind of shut down and I go numb a little bit, which is what, when this conversation happened with my coach, when she was reminding me, like feeling is your superpower. Like how often are you crying right now? I was like, Oh yeah. Like I shut down. My anxiety took over and was like numb out. It's better. And so I had to speak to my anxiety and be like, we're opening back up and we can handle it. Um, so something I'm also doing in this realm right now is, I'm, I've decided to stop drinking for about a month. It's a little over a month. I have a trip to San Diego in October. And I was like, you know what, what if I don't drink until San Diego? And part of that is because there's something about being so clear and open right now. Because I'm, I'm wanting to tap into a deeper, deeper layer of feeling right now. Uh, because there's like some sneaky numbing, some sneaky walls that have been coming up in, uh, some stuff I'm wanting to like move forward on. So anyway, uh, part of what I'm doing this during this next month is I'm like cutting out alcohol just for this time to see what happens and to see if that's been like a, even though I don't actually use it as a buffer, it accidentally ends up buffering me. Right. So we'll see, we'll see what happens there, but I'm excited to, to see what happens. Um, so yeah, so I hope this was helpful. Uh, this kind of stuff 
is also what I'm working with my clients on. Like I'm having these kinds of conversations with my one-on-one -on -one clients all the time. Because when it comes to money, a lot of times I hear things like, why can't I do this? Or why is this so hard? Or why do I keep having this reaction? Or like, I just can't get this spending habit out of my body or like, yeah, I keep having the same response over and over. I keep avoiding. Why do I keep those, those frustrating questions that kind of feel rhetorical that don't really feel like they have an answer. A lot of times it's like living in this realm, right? Of like, what are you not letting yourself think about? What are you not letting yourself feel? Like what, like I was talking to one of my clients the other week and um, I think I've told this story maybe on the podcast, but we were talking about some of her feelings about like, why can't I save more? I just want to like save faster. And we were looking at her spending, how much she's paying for herself from her business and what her personal expenses are. And I was like, well, the first thing you could do is you can move. You could sell your house and move somewhere else. She was like, absolutely not. Like it was an immediate shutdown. And we dug into that a little bit. And what we realized was like the reason it's an immediate shutdown, the reason I'm not even allowing myself to feel anything about that or think about that is because I'm afraid I'm going to want to do it. And so then we like dug into that. But do you see how like wanting to save more led us to maybe you need to move? Like it's a very, and, and the maybe we need to move actually isn't about spending less money. What we got to was like, oh, I actually might really desire living somewhere else regardless of the cost, but I don't want to allow myself to think that because, and uh, insert X, Y, and Z reasons, right, that we dove into. But this is, this is why I love working on fucking money, because money is the lowest common denominator to change the rest of your life. Because your money habits, everything that's happening in your bank accounts, the things you want and why you don't have them yet, it's going to lead you to every other part of your life. Money is like when you start to like click money together and like click those things together, it's like everything else starts clicking together. Your emotions are so intrinsically tied to money. And although I'm not, I also want to be very clear, I'm not like a licensed therapist, but I talk a lot about this being like money therapy, right? When you're working on your money and you're working on your numbers, you can't divorce your emotions from it, which is why it's so important to be aware of your emotions and your feelings and know how to feel them. I had another client who she was avoiding her financial CEO party month after month after month after month. And we kept talking about it. Like, where is this avoidance coming from? Right. And uh, she would do parts of her CEO party, but not other parts. Right. And it's because she had kind of shut herself down from feeling because there were so many things that she was wanting to feel and it felt overwhelming. Like she wouldn't be able to actually like take action and do things based on what would come up from her feeling. And she also hadn't felt safe to feel the things that she needed to feel for so long. So what we got down to was like, oh yeah, here's the real root emotion that you don't want to feel right? So when we start to feel that it's going to crack you open and you're able, you'll be able to do your, your money date this month. And she was able to, and then it was like, yep. Okay. Now we did the money date and we got to the root fear and what that made her experience. Right. And why she didn't want to feel that feeling. And okay. Let me also say something about feelings here. Feelings are physically in your body, right? They're, they're not thoughts. They're just here. And the, the feelings, although they can be scary to experience physiologically in your body, they can't kill you. They literally can't. It's just a sensation somewhere in your body. All of my feelings tend to happen right here, right in the heart, right there. Just so much right there. Sometimes in my gut, but usually right here or right in my throat. And the feelings, right, the they're just sensations. And I'm going to tell you right now, I have had like anxiety about my feelings because of like, it, this is my anxiety talking now too, but like they are, they can be extremely scary and uncomfortable to feel, but at the end of the day, they can't kill you. And so being afraid to feel a feeling, keeping you from all the things you want in your life, like remember that if you're, if you allow your, your body to feel anything, the bigger your capacity to feel, the bigger your capability to do what you want to do, right? And there's layers and layers and layers to this. I have so many 
I have layers right now against, um, like I have some blocks with feeling things about visibility, right? Like being seen at a, at a higher level and a bigger scope. And there are some feelings that I'm afraid to feel around that. Um, and around my acting career, there's like some things that I'm afraid to feel when it comes to like external perception, right? Like shame or, or disappointment, right? There are some things I'm afraid to feel in my body. So I keep having to remember so I'm really going to not have my dreams come true because I'm afraid to feel a sensation in my body. That's so silly. That's so silly. That's what I have to tell myself. But whatever you need to tell yourself. Um, so being afraid to feel your feelings is the only thing stopping you from doing the things that you need to do that you want to do. And again, this is can be scary sometimes, which is why so many of my coaching calls with my clients revolve around this stuff because the strategy is so easy, y'all. It's so motherfucking easy. The money flow method is so stupidly simple. It's so stupid. It's so stupid how simple it is. It's so stupid how easy it is to manage your money without a budget. It's so crazy. Like, and I, I'm fangirling because I use this method. It's crazy how simple it is for me to manage my money. And I have a full on business making over six figures a year. And even with that and doing my own bookkeeping, less than an hour a month is what it takes me to manage. And I don't have to budget. It's insane. So like this shit is so simple. <laughs> the strategy is so simple. You want to hit a goal? Great. Here's the math. Here's the math to hit that savings goal. Here's the math to retire in 10 years. Here's the math to buy that house in Malibu. Here's the math to be able to go travel the world for two years. Like, it, it, the money is math. It's so simple. Strategy is so simple. It's all this stuff, the feeling stuff, the body stuff, the mental stuff. That gets in the way of being able to actually take action on the math, right? Which is why I would say about 70% of the coaching calls with my clients live in this arena. 30% is the strategy, right? But 70% lives here, which is why coaching is a thing. Like, I can't just give you a template to be like, and here's how to completely heal your relationship with money, right? Like, I give you all the tactical tips and tricks. Go binge my podcast. Like, it's if you, if you go study my podcast and my Instagram, you'd have all the strategy you need there, right? But it, the reason you haven't taken action on it, the reason you're still feeling a little bit stuck with your money is because of this stuff right? That it, that this is what coaching is working on, right? It's giving you the strategy, but then working on all of the other stuff that's getting in the way of you being able to use the strategy to actually make the things happen. Uh, hope this was helpful. I hope you all have a fantastic Monday. I'm probably going to go take a nap before I do any other work today. Uh, stay tuned if I do any work today, because I'm going to go listen to my body. And I think I think I feel a cry coming on. <laughs> Just kidding. No, but I probably will at some point today. Um, okay. Love you all. Happy Monday. Thanks so much for tuning in. Come join me on Instagram for more on how to build a simple, sexy relationship with your money. My Instagram handle is at not starving artists. And if you want to dive deeper with me, head to the show notes to learn more about one-on-one -on -one coaching. If you love this episode, subscribe, leave a review and share it with a friend that you want to get rich with.